All right, well, let's open up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 as we continue our series on the armor of God. God has been faithful. He has been kind to us. He has challenged us in great ways as together we are putting on the whole armor of God. Week one was all about be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then for the next two weeks, we, we considered this enemy, this opponent, right, uh, that we are called to stand against the schemes of the devil, our battles not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. And then we challenge ourselves to get ready. As you look at verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And so as we talked over and over, Paul is like a broken record player, right? He's just telling us, stand, stand, stand. Well, y'all know what we're about to do. Let's stand in honor of God's word. Let's take Paul literally here, and let's get ready to put on this armor of God together. We're gonna lock in on verses 14 through 17 as we jump into our fourth piece of armor, the shield of faith, the shield of faith. And y'all need to pray for me because I'm gonna try and preach this in 20 minutes. This is my favorite piece of armor. We might do a, a week two and uh, I might preach on the shield of faith next week too. I got a lot to share in regards to this important piece of armor, which remember, these are not separate um, things detached from God. It's the very presence of God in our lives. So God's word says this in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter six, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now some scholars and commentaries would say that those first three pieces of armor the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, the gospel of peace should remain with you at all times. Hence the put on, right? And then we're gonna shift here to take up. I told you this from day one because I'm just not that holy, I'm not that spiritual. I need everything that God has to offer at all times with me. And so although some commentaries would say, you know, the first three you should have on at all time, the second three, uh, you take up during specific moments of battles, of warfare, all that stuff. Maybe you guys pray differently than me, but the enemy has never told me this. Hey, Rob, get ready, I'm coming. Has that happened for y'all? <laughs> I never know when he's coming and when he's bringing attacks on my life. I never know when it's gonna be hard for me to stand up for King Jesus in my neighborhood. I never know when I go and attend a party when that party gets out of line and I gotta leave. I never know. So for me, I can't leave home without them. And I would encourage you when it comes to the shield of faith, don't leave home without it. So let's talk about it. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up, everybody say take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of God. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Take up the shield of faith. Um, last week as we were in worship, if you were here with us last week and uh, so thankful under Pastor Mark Christian's leadership, we have invited Brandon and Joy Sutton to join our team as our music arts director. And the Lord just was so kind to me in worship as I had a lot of things going on in my mind. And the Lord just said, trust in me, Rob. Enjoy and rest in the promises of God. We as God's people have faith in God. 
And what is faith? Faith is firm, unshakable belief in God. And the Apostle Paul is equipping us with the shield of faith as he's led through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is compelling his people to walk by faith. Can we all be honest? That's hard. We, we want to see. <laughs> we we want to know. We, we want to make sure everything is in place. Walking with so many young ministers of the gospel. There's too much of this. Well, Pastor Rob, I'd be interested, you know, if that church gave me the right package. You know, Pastor Rob, if the pastor preach the way I liked pastors to preach. You know, I'll surrender to the Lord's ministry as long as, you know, I get a certain percentage of my seminary education paid for, and then that's got to be God's affirmation in my life. And I'm here to tell you that not just for ministers of the gospel, but for every single one of us, yes, aren't we thankful that God does sometimes give us certainty, and he gives us things that we will know but most of the Christ life is a life of faith. Faith. It's a trusting in God instead of you telling God. Faith. Let, let's talk about the shield of faith. Reading from one commentary, this Roman shield was the central part of the soldier's defense, this Roman soldier's defense. Rectangular in shape, rounded on the ends. It was typically made from two sheets of wood that were glued together, then covered with canvas and leather. The canvas and leather could be doused with water to protect against flaming arrows. Shield weighed 22 pounds, was roughly 37 to 42 inches high, 27 to 33 inches across. The metal piece ran across the center of the shield so they could be used as a weapon to punch or to push forward. A lot of pastors don't preach of the shield of faith as an offensive weapon, but I want to perhaps declare to us that we are called to take up the shield of faith, yes, as a powerful defensive weapon, but also as an offensive weapon. So I wanna unpack some of these things for you. First of all, let's consider as most pastors do preach about it being a defensive weapon, let's consider the fact that the shield of faith is a defensive weapon in our lives. The shield of faith protects us from the attacks and the arrows of the enemy. The enemy wants to throw darts of doubt, of confusion, of temptation in regards to our faith. In just a few moments, as we even pass our baskets to faithfully and cheerfully give unto the Lord through our tithes and offerings, we're going to show you a highlight video of, of people in our church over the last few months who have been baptized publicly. And, and for some, they'd say, why do I have to do that publicly? To me, it's jabbing Satan in the throat. Because you're going to be filled with doubts. You're gonna be filled with all these flaming darts of the evil one because we battle with our sin, we battle with our flesh, and the enemy would love to convince you that that life that you have in Jesus is not for real. And so when we're secret with our faith and the enemy comes and attacks us, we don't have the memories, the public memories, the testimony, right, the outward testimony of inward change to say, no, I know I got doubts, I know I'm struggling in sin, but I know on this day I publicly professed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I identified myself as a follower of King Jesus. I pray you know Jesus. So why do we still struggle with our faith? Um, there's two ways in which the enemy will come at you that you need to activate this shield of faith defensively. Number one, the enemy will try and distract you. The enemy will try and distract you. Ephesians chapter six and verse 16, in all circumstances, 
take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Flaming darts. Um, the Lord kind of, as I've been studying this over the years, revealed something to me years ago about these flaming darts. I mean, why flaming darts? Darts don't really need flames to kill you. The flames are intended to distract you. So if I'm in combat and I've got my shield up, the darts at the opponent, the enemy, is shooting at me are in flames. You pick up your shield of faith, you have no power. You want to pick up the shield of faith in God, not the shield of faith in you, shield and faith in our country, the shield of faith in anything that we have to bring. No, this, this is the shield of faith in God because there's a promise that it will extinguish the flames. But if when the enemy shoots those flaming darts at you and you pick up your shield, what's going to happen? It's going to ricochet behind you. You're going to be engaged in this warfare with the enemy. With that shield, you're somewhat protected, but because he shot a flaming dart, what would a flaming dart cause behind you if it ricocheted behind you? A fire. And the enemy would love for you to lose focus. He would love to distract you so that you would turn your back to deal with his distraction. And the moment you turn your back to that distraction, he's got you. So each and every person in the house, I love you. What is the enemy distracting you with? And, and guys, these can be good things. I just encourage our church to go out and vote. It's a good thing for you to participate in what is so important in our country right now. But isn't it amazing how much the enemy right now is throwing some flaming darts to distract the church on what's most important right now? You see, this distraction, when the enemy tries to distract you, oh Lord, we need your shield of faith immediately to extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy. The second way is when the enemy tries to isolate you. When the enemy tries to isolate you. By faith, we can defeat the enemy, but listen to me, this is not a solo act. God never designed for us as Christians to walk with Jesus alone. He created his church. And I love when you study this shield of faith and in wartime, right, we would find that, especially back in the day, and Roman soldiers of Paul's day were sometimes subject to a showering of arrows from a number of different places. And so it is with life. And I need my brothers and sisters beside me watching my blind side, calling me out for acting the fool, being an encourager when I'm filled with doubt. And those Roman soldiers would form this tortoise formation, right? So that there was no weak spot to resist these flaming darts. We need each other, don't we? I love Ephesians chapter four. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow and so builds itself up in love. In love. Romans chapter one, verse 16 through 17. Church, 
Paul declares, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to who? Everyone. Everyone who believes. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Great defensive weapon. But we also take up the shield of faith as an offensive weapon. All right, I want to read a lot of scripture, but listen to this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. Listen to this. Because it talks about this faith as an offensive weapon. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance... Look at this description of this faith that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for who? For you. Who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this church, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various Trials. What are we learning in the army series, armor series? This is not, this is not a passage for those who aren't in warfare. And the Christ life is a battle filled with warfare. But we have our faith. We know we might lose some battles. We cannot lose the war. So we have faith. Verse seven, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's this faith. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your what? Faith, the salvation of your souls. So just quickly there, that faith there is described in three ways. If you go and look at verse four, number one, this faith is imperishable. Psalm 145, 13 your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Want to be on a winning team? Team Jesus. Number two, this faith is undefiled. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. <laughs> Nothing in this world's perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Number three, this faith is unfading. Psalm 34, five, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Thank you, Lord. So what are three offensive plays? I'm a coach right now, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna put up on the board three offensive plays. I get tired of playing defense sometimes. Now remember, in these offensive plays, this is the flaming darts, the enemy would love for you to chase after him. We stand. We stand our ground. But here's three offensive plays. Write these down. Some of y'all ain't writing these down. You ain't fighting this week. I need some plays. Number one, check this out. It's believing trust in him. That's your first play. Notice I didn't say do a bunch of things for him. That's religion. We don't actually believe in religion at First Baptist Charlotte. We believe in the gospel. Religion says, do this, do this, do this, you get things from God. That's straight from the pit of hell. 
The gospel says you can't, but Jesus did. And because Jesus did, now you can. So we start out with believing trust in him. Colossians chapter two, verse six to seven. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Have you received Christ Jesus as Lord? I didn't ask you how long have you been a member of this church. I haven't asked you how much you've given to the poor. I haven't asked you what you've done this past week. Have you trusted? Have you received in Jesus Christ? As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so also walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught. Abounding. In thanksgiving. Believing trust in him. All right, play two. Play two. Expectant impact for him. Wake up tomorrow with the shield of faith, believing that God is going to use you in a powerful way for his glory. For this is the promise of our creator. You to do great things in Jesus' name. I'm running out of time, but I gotta read this story because it's so powerful. On May 31st, 1791, William Carey began the gathering by preaching on Isaiah chapter 54. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. His text at first seemed a curious choice. In light of the many crystal clear New Testament texts on evangelism and discipleship making, why did William Carey choose a text from the prophets to argue for a great commission's possibility? Carey knew the scriptures well. And he recognized the brilliance and the importance of Isaiah's redemptive historical vision. The victory of the suffering servant, would result in not only rejoicing, but blessing. Isaiah foresaw that the Messiah's victory would forever incapacitate the enemies of God. No longer could the bewitching of foreign gods prevent nations from receiving God as king. God's people would spread abroad from the right and the left, possess the nations and people of the desolate cities. This future vision carry new was realized in the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So the crescendo of his message was captured from Isaiah by those who heard it in six unforgettable words. Expect great things. Attempt Great things. Carries high view of God and the guaranteed victory that we have in Jesus Christ compelled him to go with this shield of faith, believing that God was about to unleash victory for his kingdom and for his glory. Family, I get it. Some of y'all wake up and the first thing you do is watch the news. No wonder you're a little down and depressed going to work. I want to encourage you not to just have a believing trust in him, but would you consider starting every day with this shield of faith with an expectant impact for him? Hebrews 11, 1 and verse 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Rewards. Number three. Y'all ready? Play number three. And then let's go eat some barbecue or whatever's out there. Victorious hope with him. 
believing trust in him, expectant impact for him, victorious hope with him. What a play. Come on, coach, preach now. That's a play right there. That's it. But notice, 1 John 4, 5, 4 says this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Um, I've got to say this in our first world Christianese world. Because, man, we can get fancy with the word faith. Having faith is not what gives faith power. People can have faith in a lot of things. It's not the idea of faith that gives us strength. It's the object of our faith. Notice, I didn't tell you believing trust, expectant impact, victorious hope. That's religion. The gospel is believing trust in him, expectant impact for him, victorious hope with him. All hail King Jesus. All hail. King Jesus. This world is trying to sell you anything but that. And I implore you here today to take up the shield of faith. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24 says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me, church. (laughs) He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Our faith is in the one who is faithful. He will surely do it. As we come to a close, every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to go back to this first, believing trust in him. Believing trust in him. Will you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God, Raised Jesus from the dead. Today, you can be saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. So I invite you here in this moment to, for the first time in your life, receive the shield of faith. Remember, we're talking about pieces of armor that you cannot access unless you know Jesus. So will you give your life to Jesus with every head bowed and every eye closed here in this moment? If right now you'd say, Pastor Rob, for the first time in my life, I'm placing my faith in Jesus, surrendering my life to him. If you're here today and that's you for the first time in your life, would you raise your hand? I just want to celebrate with you here in this moment. Anybody in the house, up in the balcony? Anybody here? Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Anybody here? As I'm scanning the room right now, I don't don't see any hands, and that's okay. I do want you to know if you're here today and you are just not ready, we're here for you. We believe God's invitations always, not just in a church building once a week. I pray that before the sun sets today, maybe it could be 
as we're enjoying some good fun and food outside, you bow and you trust in Jesus. Whenever that is, I pray that you would surrender it all. What that could mean here in this room is that every single one of us in this room know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if that's true, man, I rejoice. You know how many places in this world would love to be surrounded by so many believers? I rejoice. Thank you, Lord. Could it be possible that there's been a lack of faith? As a believer, we get attacked with flaming darts. You've been overcome by the distractions. I had a conversation just yesterday with somebody. Politically, they, they, they really think that if their candidate doesn't get in, this world's about to fall apart. That's a flaming arrow. Jesus is king and he ain't panicking ever. <laughs> 